Hi, I'm Diane Hullett. Welcome to the Best Life, Best Death podcast. Today, I've got another two guest episode, which I think is really fun. I've been having a few of these lately. And today I'm talking with Lisa Paul and Lori Lo Cicero of the Death Deck and the EOL Deck. So hi, welcome. Hi, thank you for having us. I thought we'd start with just, um, you know, both of you introduce yourselves and talk about how you got into this work and how you came to create this game, the death deck. And then we'll talk about your new deck of cards as well. Perfect. Well, I'll start. I'm Lori Lo Cicero, uh, one of the co-creators of both the games with Lisa Paul. And Lisa and I actually met when my late husband was at home on hospice something that we weren't expecting in our early 40s, but something that, you know, as we know, life throws us curveballs. So uh, we uh, ended up with the last two weeks and two days of his life on home hospice. Uh, and that's where I met Lisa Paul, who was the hospice social worker that that came in. And she was the one that really sort of shepherded me through all of the questions and the oddities and the this all of the chaos that comes with that uh, and what we weren't expecting. And uh, Lisa and I, uh, she became my bereavement support person, uh, one of many actually, but one of my favorites, and uh, kind of guided me through that as well. And during the course of that, we realized that you know I was not alone in what had happened and what you know what it looks like at the end. So we ventured out to do something about it, to create a game and now games that can help people talk about this stuff so that they're not so shocked when it happens and they are better prepared. I love that. How about you, Lisa? Yes. So Lori, Lori did a great job with our origin story there. And uh, so just a little more background on me. Um, I have my master's in social work in 1999 from University of Michigan and have worked for over 15 years in hospice. Um, I've also worked eight years in emergency medicine. And in both of those positions, I have found time and time again that people just aren't prepared for death, whether it's a sudden death or even with a life-limiting diagnosis. We, we tend to push away the thought of death and, and not prepare. And when when we don't prepare, it not only leaves kind of a mess for the grievers left behind, but it also uh, limits us being able to have the death that we want because we haven't had conversations and our family members don't know what to do. And like um, Lori's husband, Joe, many people towards at the end of their life can't speak anymore and they can't speak for themselves and family members end up making quite a few decisions in those last um, couple of weeks of life about things related to um, how many visitors should be there, how much pain medicine should be present, what they want to see and hear and taste and smell and all of these wonderful things. So we created um, the death deck to help people get the conversation going. And then we created our EOL deck in March um, to, that's a little bit more of a specialized deck. Say more. So for people who are listening, like by deck, we mean literally a deck of cards. And what's the EOL deck? What does EOL stand for? So our EOL deck is the end of life deck. And so the EOL deck is 52 questions specifically targeting people with life-limiting illnesses and people of advanced age. So we, we took some of the same topics from our death deck and some new ones and created the questions to be a little bit more sensitive um, with the thought in mind that these people are approaching the end of their life. And we're gonna talk about the topic a little differently when we're close to the end of life than when it's an abstract, it's, it's never abstract, we're all going to die, but it feels more abstract when we're younger or before we have a, a life-limiting illness. And so the EOL deck is, is designed for um, end-of-life professionals, like hospice professionals, palliative care professionals, uh, people working in senior centers, um, boarding cares, assisted living, and 
uh, as well as family members. So you don't have to be an end of life professional to use the deck. There, there are questions that family members can talk about as well. Um, but we really wanted a tool for the hospice professionals and people coming into the home to be able to help people have the death that they want. And it can be hard to start those conversations. I know as a hospice social worker, it can be difficult to have those conversations. And, um, and so this is a, a tool to help everyone. One of the things I love about it is it, um, you know, it's like it offers some optional answers and we'll give an example, but within those answers, there's quite a range. And then you might find yourself like, no, none of those answers apply, but this is my answer. So I, I think you've done a, an amazing job of just what you've said, creating a tool that creates conversation. For example, I loved this one when I was looking through it on special occasions, how could your family honor you? And I thought this was such a great question because it's just a way of thinking about our legacy and our family and what we leave behind and what we people will do after you're gone. We are gone. So as you said, a life limiting illness. So the answers are A, lighting a candle and sharing a memory. B, visiting the location of my final resting place or C, bringing family and friends together to partake of my favorite meal. So, you know, someone could be having this conversation and go, well, no, no, none of those, but it gives them something to react to and respond to, right? And I think that's a big way that you've designed this. Exactly. We love the D answers that aren't on the card, but people often come up with like, well, it's none of those, like what you were saying. It's, it's actually this, but by having those choices and by asking that question, then it allows to open the door for people to, to, to say those very things. So yeah, that's we, we, we love that. We love the D answer. <laughs> I love the D answer, the DEF answer. Another one I thought was super relevant in this day and age was those pesky passwords. Where can we find them all? A says, I have a password manager, but you'll need the password for that too. B says, oh, grab a pen. We better write them down now. And C says, oh, I don't know. My computer remembers them. I don't. All of which create really good conversation. And it's so important, right? In this day and age, I was, I've was i heard some really difficult stories of people who can't get into their loved one's phone. And it becomes this really big deal that you can't open a phone after someone has died. You lose all those pictures, all the emails, everything that's stored on there. So Love the password one for spurring conversation. Yeah. Well, so well, go ahead. And the other thing that I really like about the multiple choice questions is it it does give people these prompts and it gives them a chance to, you know, when when, when you're in school, you're in high school, let's say you have an essay test or you have a multiple choice test, right? We all know what you were hoping your teacher was going to give you. It's that multiple choice test because <laughs> you can't, it's it's very hard to come up with um, these open-ended answers. We do have some open-ended questions um, because we do see a lot of value in, in some of the questions being that nature, especially legacy questions. There's not necessarily multiple choice options for everything, but um but, you know, this is a difficult topic and it's really hard for people to think about their mortality and their end of life. And so um, the multiple choice does help uh, break some of those barriers and say, OK, we're going to make it a little easier of a test for you, a little easier of an activity for you. We're going to we're going to give you some choices and, and you pick the best one for you. Well, let's talk about that resistance piece, because I think that's such a huge component for people. And there was a really good quote on your website that I grabbed, which said, from sample questions to poignant stories, these decks explain the reason, well, whoops, I said that wrong. From sample questions to poignant stories, they explain the reason they created the game and how they use humor and lively gameplay to break down resistance and open up communication. And I thought like if I had to put one phrase on the death deck and the EOL deck, I think that's what you're trying to do is to break down resistance and open up conversation. But you've both experienced a huge range of this. Why, why are we so resistant? Well, 
Well, I think part of it ties into what we were just saying about the open-ended and multiple choice. I mean, I think people are resistant when you say, okay, let's talk about your final wishes. And it's like, oh, that's just so, it's this big kind of topic-y thing. It's like, how do I even start? So, you know, I think it's, if you if you break it down into those bite-sized pieces, it makes it easier. But we resist, you know, even sitting down and, and talking about this. And I think too, we resist it when, we've been given a diagnosis when it's too close to home, when a family member is dying. And that's really why we created the original deck is, you know, why are we waiting until that moment to talk about it? That's when, when we don't want to talk about it. That's when it's hardest to talk about. So, you know, we're very resistant in that moment because it curses it or it's, it's, it's too emotional. So, you know, breaking down resistance with a tool or a game is what we're trying to do and trying to break into those moments when it's not in that crucial moment. Like when we're just talking about, you know, well, a game night, <laughs> we're not even talking about death, but let's talk about it in this, this setting. Uh, or, you know, when you sit down to do, okay, well, we're going to get married. So let's, you know, do our paperwork. So now's a good time. You know, it's, it's off in the future, hopefully, but now's a good time. So it's just, trying to find those avenues and those places to talk about it when the walls aren't up. Mm -hmm. and, and I'll add, I think as a culture, we, we prioritize youth and um, we tend to avoid death uh, as a topic. You know, I think we, often there's phrases uttered of, Let's talk about something more pleasant, right? Why are we on this dark topic? This is disappointing. Or I mean, sorry, this is um, this is depressing. Why are we talking about this? And so we're reluctant to talk about hard things, I think, um, as a culture. And, and we don't want to accept the fact that we're mortal. We want to pretend like if I get this nice anti-aging cream I'm going to look this way forever and I'm not going to get old and I'm not going to lose my parents and they're always going to be alive and if we just push it away I won't have to deal with it today but but we know that that like most things it doesn't work to not just talk about something it there's consequences when we don't when we don't deal with the things that that we need to. And whether that's in a relationship, if you never talk about money, uh, that's going to be a problem, right? You never talk about your sex life with your partner. That's probably going to be a problem at some point. And, and the same is true. You know, we have death, sex, money as kind of these taboo topics in American culture. And I would say a lot of the world. And, uh, each of those has consequences when we don't directly deal with them. And we all know that it's natural to avoid hard things, but, but usually what happens is one, you feel great when you finally get something done that's been nagging at you. It occupies this brain space. When, we're, when, we, when I have something on this to-do list that I know I'm just putting off and putting off and putting off, I, I feel that, you know? And so there's something really uh, satisfying about checking off the thing that, that you can then feel good about that you actually dealt with. And, and I think the other nice thing that happens when we finally have these important conversations is you feel really connected with the person that you're talking with because... These are meaningful, deep conversations. And while they're hard, the, the benefit is usually this, this really lovely connection and, and strengthening of that relationship once you get through these type of conversations. I love that, Lisa. I think that's such a beautiful outcome of this kind of playful deck is really the intention is really connection and truth telling and getting to know someone's wishes. And I think about Barbara Carnes, you know, who loves to say classic Barbara Carnes, end of life educator. And she loves to say, people don't die like they do in the movies. And I, I, I reflect on that a lot. Like every time I see a death in a movie, I think, 
Yeah, that looked a little too simple. Like really, they were speaking and looking pretty good right up to the end. And in fact, for many, many deaths, it's quite a process. And as you said, we lose the ability to speak, to communicate. And so it can be too late for these conversations. So I love that the death deck is really trying to be upstream, right? Really like let's have these conversations when it's um, a little more playful and easier and just like introducing the topic. And then the EOL deck is really, as you said, for someone with a life limiting illness, diagnosis, sense of time really shortening, that then there are these questions that can still be asked and discussed and bring us closer as family members and friends. Mm -hmm. So you're both, I mean, your business, let me start that over. So the death deck is really active on social media, which I think is so interesting and neat. And I think it brings it to a younger audience, as we said, like upstream. Why do you think that's important now? Well, our social media also brings in education and resources. Um, we, we typically post every day and um, try to bring in, like I said, education, um, additional resources. We use both the EOL and the Death Deck um, questions to, to get people involved and engaged. I, I love reading people's responses and, um, and hearing how, how different people have very, very different responses, sometimes based on their own experiences, their beliefs, uh, and it's, it, we've created a little, a nice little community of people who regularly are commenting and posting or making, um, telling their own stories. And so I think one of, one of our purposes of the, the social media aspect of our business is, is really being part of the EOL community, the end of life community. You know, we want to support other people who are doing great things as well. So we try to share a lot of what other people are doing. We like to also let people know about the events we're hosting. We've been doing quite a few events here locally in Los Angeles. And so that's been really fun to um, be out in the community with people and bringing death into breweries and coffee shops. And uh, it's it's been it's so fun to me uh, to, to be in the presence of other people within the end of life space. And we've found that that other people really crave that connection too. So yeah, it's it's been interesting for me too. I'm I'm one of those odd birds who was actually not on any social media before starting Best Life, Best Death. So I wasn't on Facebook at some kind of the height of Facebook. But now I'm really involved with it. And just like you said, I think one of the most interesting things to me is the sense of weaving a community of people who really work in this field and are supporting each other in kind of working with death with their clients in new ways and just kind of softening the whole experience. And so I love both the interactions with other end of life workers and also the interaction with the general public and kind of their surprise and their um, kind of astonishment that there's this whole positive feeling or I, I don't know, I don't love the word positive death movement because I feel like it's a little too light, but like um, Sarah Kerr, a wonderful Canadian death doula says, we can do death better, you know, and I, I just love that kind of phrasing. It's like, I, yeah, I think we can. I really think we can. And I think these tools you've created are such an interesting kind of like, it's like they're a crack into a hard topic. And somebody on Instagram the other day had a great metaphor, and I'm kicking myself because I would like to credit the person, but I don't remember who it is. And she was having a conversation with hospice nurse Julie, and she said, you know, it's like death is this ocean that we're all facing. So do you want to walk down that beach and be sucked in by the undertow with no preparation? Or do you want to step off the shore in a boat that you built with your friends and family rowing across to this other shore? And I thought that was such a good, good, good metaphor. Let me see if I can find real quick who it was. Mm -hmm. Give her credit. In the meantime, let me see if I can get this camera to come back. Okay. Got to get that figured out. Occasionally I go out of focus. So sorry oh, yeah. about that. 
Here it is. This was, oh, oh, great. This was Distant Shores Deaf Care who put up that metaphor. And I just thought it was beautiful. Mm. Yeah, great. Well, Distant Shore, that's a great, that makes sense. The, using the, the beach metaphor with Distant Shore, that's lovely. Totally, <laughs> totally lovely. Do yeah, you, I love that. That's a great metaphor. I haven't thought of it that way, but when you were talking about that too, you know, isn't isn't that a delightful way to build that boat and to to be able to go off but for the person who's transitioning but then also for the family members that are experiencing or watching the transition is it is it so much easier it is to watch that beautiful boat take off than to watch someone get sucked in by the undertow so it's it's both for the person that's dying but also all of those people around them i love that uh, that visual so well, I, love, I don't love the visual, but you know yeah. what I mean? It's like, it's, it's a, a great, great way to explain it. Yes. It's an apt visual. And I think yes. it's like, you know, Laura, you had that experience with Lisa, like Lisa was helping you build this boat for your husband, even if it was too fast, too young, too unexpected, all the terrible things that make it so, so difficult. The fact that you had someone helping build that boat for you and for him is, yeah. is just, it changes the whole experience. Indeed. Yeah, and I would say that when I when I go into a hospice patient's home that has had these kind of conversations where first of all they're talking, they're acknowledging the fact that they're dying and so is the family. Step 1. Which which there's quite a few hospice patients that that first step is not in place when someone comes on to hospice. Maybe maybe they've come on to hospice but they um they don't want us to talk about the fact that the person's dying um, or the person themselves is reluctant to have um, those conversations. So when there is, when people do acknowledge, both the person and the family acknowledges that this person is dying and there's been some preparation in place, myself when i walk into the home i can feel the difference it is not chaotic it is it may still be very stressful because there are symptoms to manage and this person is is dying um however there is a much greater sense of there being a plan in place and people being more comfortable and at peace with that plan because they've had some time They've done some work already in that way. And when I walk into a home where they aren't, haven't had these conversations or they don't even want to talk about it, um, there's, there, there's a lot of chaos and there's typically a lot of anxiety. Um, and, and that part is really, I mean, it's, it's, it's tangible how, how strong the difference is um, between those two scenarios. So my, my dream, you know, and why I wanted uh, to create these decks with Lori is, is getting more and more people in that, in that we've done the work stage before, before I meet them. So huge. I'm just so struck because if the acknowledgement is there, then the education can come, right? Education sounds like such a big dry word, but like the information that helps them settle into the experience and understand more of what's happening, mm -hmm. that can't be shared if there's no acknowledgement. So the acknowledgement is really key and then, and then other pieces can follow. Mm -hmm. My dogs are barking. I don't know if that's coming through on the recording. <laughs> I'm not hearing it. Gives me a little pause. <laughs> Let me read one more of these. I loved this one too. I'll read one that's very practical and one that's more um, mystical. Regarding your important documents, living will, advanced directive, power of attorney. A, my family knows exactly where to find them. B, they're done, but I'm not 100% sure where I filed them. C, uh, they aren't finished or we're never started, right? That's so key on a practical level. Do you have your paperwork in place? I know for my husband and I, perfectionism really got in the way of completing documents for a long time. And finally, we were like, these don't have to be perfect. They just have to be good enough. Mm -hmm. That's my advice. 
And then I love this one. If you could communicate with loved ones after you're gone, how would you show yourself? A, as a bird, butterfly, or other special animal. B, with specific numbers or objects like pennies or feathers. Or C, with music, scents, or something else unique. How did you develop that question? Oh, that is my thing. That's the signs from beyond. And I get so many of them. And uh, I love hearing people's stories about them. So I love that you could um, maybe even talk about it ahead of time. <laughs> I don't know how it works, but I just, I love the variety of ways that, that people have that acknowledgement in their lives of signs that people have passed. And, you know, if you could choose it, I love, I love the fact that talking about that, like if you could, how would you? So. I love well, it too. It really jumped out at me. Go ahead, Lisa. And how sweet. I mean, I, if, if, if we, if Lori and I have a conversation about how she's going to show up for me after she dies and then, um, not to kill you off, Lori. Sorry about yeah, that. Yeah, ouch. Like, <laughs> now I'm going to haunt you. <laughs> but let's say she tells me, you know, I'm going to show up for you in, um, in, in, in pennies, let's just say. And, and so I, I have, I carry that, that idea around with me. And then, you know, after Lori dies and who knows, right? Who knows? So maybe, maybe there is a way. And so a lot of our questions are, have an educational piece. Um, but then some are just like, like this one, right? This is just beliefs. This is just um, magical, mystical, what we don't know kind of um, questions. And I think they're all, it's, it's always so interesting to me to hear where people go with those kind of things. Because usually when I ask someone that question, they start talking about the signs they've received from their loved ones, right? Um, which people typically love to share. Uh, but then they, but then we usually get into a greater conversation about their beliefs about afterlife and if they can have a hand in putting things in front of people. And then it just goes in and then it's an hour later and we're still talking about that question. <laughs> totally. That's what I was thinking with that question. I thought that in of itself would lead to so many stories around a dinner table for sure. For sure. And how often do people ask about that like that's the other thing so it's it's something that people I think want to share a lot of times they don't know how to break into that conversation or or share something like that maybe they've experienced it but with a question like that then it's it, it opens it up it's like here here's an here's an open forum here's some space and share away right and here it's in the deck like this is right. part of, this is part of the lexicon part of the language around end of life if we let it be or someone could say oh I don't want to answer that question you know Okay, you get to go back to the will question and answer that, you know, the drive. <laughs> right, something for everyone. Something for everyone. <laughs> I love that. Well, thank you so much, Lisa and Lori. I just love, you know, my whole shtick with best life, best death is just how do we have conversations about this and how do we have them before we need to have them, before we have to have them. And I think that's where we just, you know, really enjoy each other's um, approach to this conversation that more and more people I think are stepping forward to have and could be having more frequently and earlier than they do. I can think of like six more questions, but I think we should probably stop. Thanks so much for your time. <laughs> Like my brain went off on these tangents when I said that. Thanks so much again to Lisa and Lori, founders, co-founders of the Death Deck and the EOL Deck. And tell people where they can find out more about you and get a hold of your decks. You can find out more about us at thedeathdeck.com and you can follow us on all social media at the Death Deck. Awesome. Thanks so much for your time. You've been listening to the Best Life, Best Death podcast, and I'm Diane Hullett, and you can find out more about the work I do at bestlifebestdeath.com. Thanks for listening.